The story I want to tell you today is about an ancient philosophy called Stoicism and its ap applicability for our daily lives today, especially when it comes to set your goals wisely. For reason of expectation management, I want to say some words to who I am and what I am not. So I'm not a researcher, I'm not an academic, and I'm not a philosopher. But I am a marketeer, I'm a digital expert, and sort of a stoic layman. Most of all, I have almost 40 years of trial and error, a humanistic education, and I'd say quite a good horse sense. But today, we will cook a Greek happy meal together. At ancient times, philosophies were schools of life, where the parents sent their children to, to be educated for a successful life. Let's meet our protagonists of our TEDx play we're setting back 2,000 years. Around 300 BC, 300 BC, two schools, two philosophies were founded. One is Stoicism by Zeno, and the other is Epicureanism by Epicurus. I show both schools because they, they're very famous they're, and they influenced our lives for centuries to this day. But they're somewhat contradictory. Below you see probably the, the, the most famous Stoics of all time. On the left side you see Seneca. Today you would say that he led a life of an investment banker. He became very rich. Then he was banished from Rome because of adultery. Then he became very rich again. He was advisor to the emperor Nero and finally was sentenced to death. In the middle you see Epictetus. Epictetus was born as a slave. And we, when he obtained his freedom, he started to, to teach philosophy in Rome. He opened a school. And well, he got banished as well. You could see a pattern there. But he got banished because the, the, emp the, the emperor at the time, Domitian, Domitian, banished all philosophers out of Rome, probably because they gained too much influence in society. And last but not least, you have Marcus Aurelius. He's been one of the most appreciated Roman, empires, uh, Roman emperors at the peak of the empire. Now you might ask what those guys have to say when it comes to modern age problems like online behavior and stress called by digitalization. Let's make one example. 350,000 tweets per minute, a half a billion a day. Who can cope with that enormous, uh, enormous amount of information? Seneca could answer with one of his very clever saying, sayings, life you receive is not short, but you make it so. Well, that might be true and very wise, but it actually doesn't help much. So before we start to cure symptoms, we should understand some underlying mechanisms and ask us if we really have a problem caused by digitalization or another stress level caused by digitalization. Let's take addictions, for example. Addictions to substances, they're nakedly destructive. On the other hand, there are many behavioral addictions which are quietly destructive and often act wrapped in cloaks of creation. And I show this picture because it's a famous game, probably everybody knows, them, uh, knows it, and it's one of the most addictive of all times. <laughs> and here's a powerful misconception. The illusion of progress will sustain you while you gain, uh, a, a, while you acquire a higher level, higher scores, you acquire more followers on Facebook, or you improve your skills playing the game. An experiment done with pigeons in the 1950s called Skinner Box has shown us that brains are releasing far more dopamine when the re reward was unexpected than when it was predictable. The rule of the pigeon game was very simple. You push a button, you get a reward. But when, we, when they changed that rule, 
that showed a completely other picture. A pigeon <clears throat> tapped a whopping 87,000 times over a period of 14 hours. That's tack, tack, tack on that button when the reward was only released less than 1% of the time. And in 2012, a bunch of Silicon Valley web developers unleashed a similar feedback experiment, but this time with hundreds of millions of human beings. The experiment took the, the form of a deceptively simple new feature called the like button. Since the likes you get for your photos and stories are unpredictable and the re release of dopamine is higher. And well, the swiping on Tinder is as close to the Skinner Bock as it gets. <laughs> so we might admit that there is a higher level of stress factors caused from the digital age, the digitalization. There are even studies saying that we're facing a mental health crisis for the generation Z. In a recent study, millennials were asked what their most important life goals are. 80% of the youngsters answered, I want to become rich. Another 50% of the same people answered, I want to become famous. And in addition to that, we constantly tell ourselves, ourselves and our youngsters that with hard work, you can achieve everything. You can achieve, uh, achieve your dreams and make your, make your dreams come true. Well, be aware of the golden carrot you set yourself in front of your nose. You might up end ending chasing rainbows. Because some of the goals are nearly impossible we, we set ourselves. But what is it that really keeps us happy and healthy as we go through our digital life? We have to state one thing, to make one thing very clear. One cannot be deliriously happy all the time. Even some people on some media, or Dionysos, or the Roman Bacchus, tells us otherwise. We see him here having one of his decadent orgies. The hedonic treadmill <clears throat> states that regardless of what happens to someone, the level of happiness return to the baseline after a certain time. So no matter if you lose your job, uh, no matter if you win the lottery, move into a new house, or on the other hand, lose your job and lose your house, after a certain time, you will, you will return to the set point of happiness. So wanting more and more and more and aiming higher in your life can't be the goal or the means to become happy. Epicurus was very aware of that fact when he said, nothing is enough for the man whom enough is too little. But now let's start to cook the Greek happy meal together. Here you see one of the main ingredients. <laughs> and what I'm going to tell you now might appear disturbing and some, somewhat counterintuitive. It's called negative visualization. Whom of you have a dog at home. You know those days, it's rainy outside, you have to get up early, you're under a lot of stress and you have to take your dog for a walk. can be annoying. For instance, just imagine for a couple of seconds that your beloved dog becomes terribly sick or even dies tomorrow. This exercise is not more than a mental trick but it works very well. It shifts your current position, being under stress and annoying, towards gratitude. And maybe you get up the next morning, still rainy outside, easier to take a dog for, for a walk, or when he stands in front of you, wagging his tail with his favorite toy in his mouth and wants to start to play, you close your laptop once more. Your consciousness <coughs> understands that your dog is not a matter of course. This leads to the next ingredient for a happy life, according to the Stoics, friendship. Epicurus put it that way, of all the things which wisdom provides to make us entirely happy, 
much the greatest is the possession of friendship. Harvard Medical School started a study 75 years ago, accompanying young people from different social classes, interviewing them about their status of happiness and their feelings. The clearest message we got from that study is good relationships keep us happier and healthier, full stop. So we should actually be the, most hap the happiest people of all times, having thousands of friends on Facebook and other social media networks and being connected to the half of the globe. Even to that, our Roman friend Seneca had an answer. He said, everywhere means nowhere. When a person spends all his time in foreign travels or surfing the internet, he ends by having many acquaintances but no friends. If you're in your kitchen trying to cook your Greek happy meal and you have to choose one, one, one kitchen tool, let it be the cooking spoon. The dichotomy of control is one of the most useful and effective tools in Stoicism. Epictetus explains it very simply. Some things are up to us and some are not up to us. So we should focus not on things we have not under our control, like the weather, the past, or death. On the contrary, we should invest all our energy in things which actually are under our control, like our relationships, our opinions, and our goals. That's where our actions are meaningful and can have an impact. The next cooking tool it's called self-denial. Sometimes I have to cut things off, the Stoic suggested, and to regularly practice self-denial. If thou wilt make a man happy, <coughs> add not unto his riches, but take away from his desires, Seneca said. Uh, Epicurus said, sorry. And Seneca, for instance, added to sleep on a hard, cold floor and wear basic clothes from time to time. He's the rich investment banker. So instead of asking what we can add, we should ask what we can remove to be happier. Whom of you takes cold showers in the morning? Bes besides that it's very healthy for your body, you know how to really appreciate a hot shower from time to time, right? <laughs> Another idea is leave your smartphone on your desk in your office overnight or put it in airplane mode. And one thing I particularly like is to navigate through a city like Dornbirn, not knowing where to go and not using Google Maps. So you have to go by memory or even ask real people. <laughs> this helps to move your comfort zone and test what you really need in your life to be happy. And most important, what you're only afraid to lose. Seneca said, we are more often frightened than hurt, and we suffer more in imagination than in reality. The kitchen tools and ingredients I showed you today, the negative visualization, good relationships, dichotomy of control, and self-denial, could help you to cook your, your own happy meal at home. And there is one particular thing I have learned from the Stoics. Always set your goals wisely. Goals we set are so hard to achieve, or even impossible, and therefore they're, dis they're disappointing. And on the other hand, we set goals which are too, way too easy to achieve, and therefore they're not fulfilling. And that's as well where the great mantra of digitalization comes in make our life easier. Every new digital device, every new digital service comes with the allure of liberating you from, from wasting time. But serotonin and dopamine, our feel-good neurotransmitters, or the, 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 the happiness spices in our meal, are only released when three conditions are fulfilled. Our daily tasks, have to be meaningful, so that they really mean something to you. They have to be desirable, 
so we really want to do them. And last but not least, they have to be feasible. You have to be capa ca capable to do them. Well, do we have to bring back a grain of resistance and pain into our lives? Let me end with the words of Marcus Aurelius, who said, the art of living is more like wrestling than dancing. Thank you very much. <laughs>